Chapter One of The Colour of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Colour of Life by Alice Maynell. Chapter One The Colour of Life. Red has been praised for its nobility as the colour of life, but the true colour of life is not red. Red is the colour of violence or of life broken open, edited and published. Or if red is indeed the colour of life, it is so only on condition that it is not seen. Once fully visible, red is the colour of life violated and in the act of betrayal and of waste. Red is the secret of life and not the manifestation thereof. It is one of the things the value of which is secrecy, one of the talents that are to be hidden in a napkin. The true colour of life is the colour of the body, the colour of the covered red, the implicit and not explicit red of the living heart and the pulses. It is the modest colour of the unpublished blood. So bright, so light, so soft, so mingled, the gentle colour of life is outdone by all the colours of the world. Its very beauty is that it is white, but less white than milk, brown, but less brown than earth, red, but less red than sunset or dawn. It is lucid, but less lucid than the colour of lilies. It has the hint of gold that is in all fine colour, but in our latitudes the hint is almost elusive. Under Sicilian skies, indeed, it is deeper than old ivory, but under the misty blue of the English zenith and the warm grey of the London horizon, it is as delicately flushed as the paler wild roses out to their utmost, flat as stars in the hedges of the end of June. For months together London does not see the colour of life in any mass. The human face does not give much of it, what with features and beards, and the shadow of the top hat and chapeau melon of man, and of the veils of woman. Besides, the colour of the face is subject to a thousand injuries and accidents. The popular face of the Londoner has soon lost its gold, its white, and the delicacy of its red and brown. We miss little beauty by the fact that it is never seen freely in great numbers out of doors. You get it in some quantity when all the heads of a great indoor meeting are turned at once upon a speaker, but it is only in the open air, needless to say, that the colour of life is in perfection. In the open air, clothed with the sun, whether the sunshine be golden and direct, or dazzlingly diffused in grey. The little figure of the London boy it is, that has restored to the landscape the human colour of life. He is allowed to come out of all his ignominies, and to take the late colour of the midsummer northwest evening on the borders of the serpentine. At the stroke of eight he sheds the slough of nameless colours, all allied to the hues of dust, soot and fog, which are the colours the world has chosen for its boys, and he makes in his hundreds a bright and delicate flush between the grey-blue water and the grey-blue sky. Clothed now with the sun, he is crowned by and by with twelve stars as he goes to bathe, and the reflection of an early moon is under his feet. So little stands between a gamine and all the dignities of nature. They are so quickly restored. There seems to be nothing to do but only a little thing to undo. It is like the art of Eleonora Duse. The last and most finished action of her intellect, passion and knowledge is, as it were, the flicking away of some insignificant thing mistaken for art by other actors, some little obstacle to the way and liberty of nature. All the squalor is gone in a moment, kicked off with the second boot, and the child goes shouting to complete the landscape with the lacking colour of life. You are inclined to wonder that, even undressed, he still shouts with a cockney accent. You half expect pure vowels and elastic syllables from his restoration, his spring, his slenderness, his brightness and his glow. Old ivory and wild rose in the deepening midsummer sun, he gives his colours to his world again. It is easy to replace man, and it will take no great time where nature has lapsed to replace nature. It is always to do by the happily easy way of doing nothing. The grass is always ready to grow in the streets, and no streets could ask for a more charming finish than your green grass. The gasometer even must fall to pieces unless it is renewed, but the grass renews itself. There is nothing so remediable as the work of modern man a thought which is also, as Mr Pecksniff said, very soothing. And by remediable I mean, of course, destructible, 
as the bathing child shuffles off his garments they are few and one brace suffices him so the land might always in reasonable time shuffle off its yellow brick and purple slate and all the things that collect about railway stations a single night almost clears the air of london but if the colour of life looks so well in the rather sham scenery of hyde park it looks brilliant and grave indeed on a real sea coast to have once seen it there should be enough to make a colourist oh memorable little picture the sun was gaining colour as it neared setting and it set not over the sea but over the land the sea had the dark and rather stern but not cold blue of that aspect the dark and not the opal tints the sky was also deep everything was very definite without mystery and exceedingly simple the most luminous thing was the shining white of an edge of foam which did not cease to be white because it was a little golden and a little rosy in the sunshine it was still the whitest thing imaginable and the next most luminous thing was the little child also invested with the sun and the colour of life in the case of women it is of the living and unpublished blood that the violent world has professed to be delicate and ashamed see the curious history of the political rights of woman under the revolution on the scaffold she enjoyed an ungrudged share in the fortunes of party political life might be denied her but that seems a trifle when you consider how generously she was permitted political death she was to spin and cook for her citizen in the obscurity of her living hours but to the hour of her death was granted a part in the largest interests social national and international the blood wherewith she should according to robespierre have blushed to be seen or heard in the tribune was exposed in the public sight unsheltered by her veins against this there was no modesty of all privacies the last and the innermost the privacy of death was never allowed to put obstacles in the way of public action for a public cause women might be and were duly suppressed when by the mouth of olympe de gouges they claimed a right to concur in the choice of representatives for the formation of the laws but in her person too they were liberally allowed to bear political responsibility to the republic olympe de gouges was guillotined robespierre thus made her public and complete amends End of chapter one